Try. 
through the trial and the change me Breathe in This world Remains Your love never fails Never gives up Never run down on me Your love shall always be my song of praise. He looked beyond my fall. So my Thank you, Jesus. 
he looked beyond my force. Amazing grace, shall always be my song of For it was that on my And I'll never know just why I to love me so. He loves one more time.
That's a lovely thought. It's a lovely thought. It's a powerful concept. It's a great reality. He looked beyond my fall and saw my need. I tell you what though, brothers and sisters, grace would have us to know that it's even greater than that. Grace would have us to know that we can sing, he looks. Yeah. He didn't just look right now. He looks beyond my fault and sees my need. Grace is not yesterday. Lift your hands and worship him. He looks beyond. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. We want to just welcome everybody who is here. Every single person. Every single solitary person. And I have a confession to make. You know what it's like in Jamaica when it rains. Especially when it pours. And I was not looking for half of the persons that I see tonight. I'm just being very honest. If I should go by our track record. So it means that you love the word of the Lord. Amen. And it means you love to hear about grace. Amen. And it means that... And it means that you love to hear the exposition of his word by people who know about grace. Amen. Blessed Amen. be the name of the Lord. Could I just ask you, we want to make sure everybody's welcome. So I want to ask us just to move around and greet about a hundred people. Amen. Every prayer. 
Amen. And we're going to be praising the Lord in giving. Amen. 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 I'm going to invite our ushers just to come and receive an offering from our choir. You may be seated for a little while. Amen. As we share a few announcements. Our September, well, first and foremost, we want to welcome everyone here again tonight on behalf of our pastor, Pastor John Mark Barlett, his wife, his family, and all the members here. If you're visiting with us tonight, we welcome you. If you are a member of Like Precious Faith and you're here tonight, could I just ask you just to stand? Amen. If you're here visiting from an assembly of Like Precious Faith, as well as somebody invited you here to come, could you please stand? We just want to acknowledge you. Amen. Welcome, 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 welcome. We're so glad you took the time to be here, and we hope you will just in time enjoy the presence of the Lord here tonight. Amen? Amen. And of course, it's good to have our guest speaker here, and our pastor will introduce him and say more. Amen? Amen. Our September to Remember services continue tomorrow and Friday at 6.30 p.m. each evening, and on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Please make every effort to bring at least one person to the service. Amen? Amen. And if you are viewing us on live stream, invite somebody to tune in tomorrow night, Friday night, and Sunday night. Sunday morning, sorry. Zone 4 will be having a prayer meeting on Saturday at Faith Basic School, 2 Duncan's Road, off Trelawney East, Waterford, Portmore at 8 a.m to 9 a.m. That's just one hour on Saturday. You know, you can come out, do what you have to do, get back home, still do what you have to do. Uh, the funeral service for the aunt of Sister Wilma Heath Malcolm will be held at Middle Quarters Seventh-day Adventist Church, St. Elizabeth on Sunday at 2 p.m. That's this Sunday at 2 p.m. Persons interested in attending are being asked to contact Brother Donovan Williams as well as Sister Esther Clark. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask us please to listen carefully to this statement. Statement in respect of the current situation. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it is likely that you have received information concerning matters relating to our assembly and its future. On Sunday, Lord willing, our pastor will be speaking to the members of Pentecostal Tabernacle in respect of this situation. We will not be having Sunday school as we customarily do on Sunday morning. Instead, we will be having a rally which will begin at 9 a.m. At approximately 12 noon after the altar service, our pastor will be addressing us. Until then, let us take each day, one step at a time, being thankful for the daily provision of God's grace. Let us, let us, as an assembly, continue to keep our eyes on Jesus, the initiator and completer of our faith, striving earnestly to truly glorify him in all that we say and do, especially at this time. Let us remember that it is never right to do what is wrong. Let us give this evening service our best effort, for all we know this could be our last. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen? Amen? Amen. Could we, could we stand? We're going to be praying, receipt of the offering. Uh, we'll be marching tonight, so we'll be marching. Amen? And by now we're used to marching. Amen? Amen. So we'll be marching tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you for another opportunity to be in your presence, to hear from you, to feel your presence, to connect with you, Lord, to engage our hearts in worship, Lord, and adoration unto you. An opportunity to hear your words for our situation, for our lives, for our future. We thank you, Lord. But we also thank you that we have an opportunity to give to your cause, to your glory, for the furtherance of your kingdom. 
And so, God, as we give tonight, we pray we will give with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus bless you. Our choir is ministering at this time.
He can make a perfect heart. Let's stand, everybody, and lift our hands. And worship the one who is making a perfect heart in you right now. Yes, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Amen. We are so grateful to the Lord for his goodness. We're so grateful to him for his love, for his mercy and his grace. Amen. We want to welcome Pastor Steve Russell from Morris Hall in St. Catherine. Amen. Sir, we welcome you and um, we're grateful that you're here. It's time for the word of the Lord. Amen. We have with us our friend and brother. Amen. Elder Mark Brown, just as I said, a great friend and a brother. Amen. By the way, do you know what's the real, genuine characteristic of a friend? A friend loveth at all times. And a brother is born for? That's how you know your friends. Amen. There are friends who love you in good times. But a true friend loves at all times. Amen. Brother Mark is a great Bible expositor, great what I call gospel preacher. He just preaches gospel. Amen. And we're delighted that he's here. The last time he came, he tore the house down and so we brought him back to reconstruct it. Come Elder Mark and talk to us. Is that Elder Gardner from Pentecostal Gospel Temple? Wonderful to have you, sir. Amen. Let's clap our hands for Elder God. Amen. Let's clap our hands for the Lord Jesus, everybody. What if you'd hug two or three people beside you and tell them, I love you, I love you, I love you. Go and find somebody, hug them and tell them, I love you, love you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, find two more people and tell them I love you too. Come on, clap your hands for the Lord Jesus. You may be seated. So glad to be here tonight and thanking God for his multiplied, tremendous blessings in our lives. Amen. We serve a great, big, wonderful God. He's always victorious, always watching over us. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. Can you clap your hands for this mighty, wonderful, holy, powerful, matchless God? Indeed, it is a privilege for me to be here tonight and with great anticipation, I anticipated being here to share the word of the Lord with you one more time. Amen. God has been tremendously good to me. He's been gracious to me, and I'm sure that he's been the same to you too. Amen. Morning by morning, new mercies I see 
All I have needed, your hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. So I'm glad to be here. I do want to greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And I do want to thank God again for Journeying Mercies coming here yesterday. The plane went up when it was supposed to and came down when it was supposed to. Even though I wasn't even aware because the lady in front of me said I snored the whole way. Amen. I snored the whole way. But um, it, it sure felt good to sleep. So I thank God for that rest. About 30,000 feet up in the air. My uncle would say, Jesus said, hi, I am with you. And lo, I am with you. But I'm glad to be here. Clap your hands if you love the Lord one more time. Amazing grace, how sweet the
say praise yeah 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 praise God praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow let the redeemed of the Lord may be seated. God bless you. Amen. Of course, I want to greet your fine pastor. Amen. The shepherd of this house whom God has used so mightily in this place. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise for our pastor? Amen. Pastor John Mark Bartlett. For his beautiful wife, Lady Lisa, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for his lovely wife and for their family. Come on, you can do better than that. Amen. Amen. I thank God for Pastor Bartlett. You know, I think the first time I met him, first time I heard him preach, he was preaching on for whom the Lord did foreknew, he did also predestinate. And it was such a marvelous, it was a Sunday night at Pentab in Miami. It was such a marvelous job. I said, whoa, whoa, this is not just a preacher. This is a teacher. Amen, amen, amen. And it blew my mind because, you know, growing up in church, sometimes you have people as as one lady said to me, I went to preach somewhere a couple weeks ago, and she said, you know, I was going to a church, but I just had to leave, because all the pastor do is just read the scripture and then just start throw a word. And she wasn't talking about the Bible words either. Just started spouting stuff, amen. But it's labor to rightly divide the word of truth, amen. And so when you find a workman that's rightly dividing the word of truth, we ought to give God praise. I said 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 we ought to give God some praise. Amen, amen. Jesus, Jesus in his, his, his talk to Peter at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, as a matter of fact, it was post-resurrection, Jesus asked Peter several times, do you love me? And three times he kept telling him, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. So what I got gathered from that is that part of Peter's expression of love to Jesus would be shown by how he fed the flock. I wish I had some help in here. Amen. And, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, pastoring today, the, really the word for pastor in the New Testament really is, tra is really shepherd. And sometimes we have a lot of shepherds that don't want to smell like sheep. They just don't want to be associated. Some of them are even CEOs, but we don't need CEOs in the pulpit. We need people that are going to rightly divide the word of truth in the pulpit. Amen. If I need to know how to, amen, grow my money, I can go to a financier. If I want my body to be looked at, I can go to a doctor. If I have legal problems, I go to a lawyer. But when I need something from God, I need a preacher that's going to be into the word of God. And Peter was so enamored or involved, rather, with his ministry that when situations rose in the church in the first century, in chapter 6 of Acts, you know what the Bible said? There was a problem between the distribution of the welfare for the widows, the Hebrew and the Grecian widows. And they thought Peter would jump all over it. And Peter said, I'm sorry. I know what my job is. It's not meet for me to leave the word of God. Am I in the Bible? And serve tables. Now, if we looked at that today, we would say Peter was acting so cocky. He thinks he's so high that he can't serve the widows. That's not what Peter was thinking. Peter was thinking, I know what my job is. 
And I'm not going to abandon what God gave me to do because there's a difference between doing good things and doing the right thing. I wish I had some help in here. Amen. So he said, you find some men that have the ability to do that, but I will give myself continually, continually to the word of God and prayer. And so we need people that are going to give themselves continually. I wish I had some help in here, man. To the word of God and prayer. So I, I thank God for his ministry. And he's not only a blessing, amen, here, but he's a blessing wherever he goes. Amen. Thank you, sir. My mission for the next few days is to survey the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. And, of course, the overall arcing theme is his grace is sufficient. It's enough for you. Now, three or four days is in no way enough time to exhaust the exploration of the grace of God. But we're going to do what we can in that short space of time. Everybody say grace. Everybody say grace. Father, we thank you and we love you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Lord God, that you have so dealt with me in your grace and with all oh, others that are here that we were concerned about the things about which we are to speak. So we pray like the psalmist now that you'd open up our eyes, that we would behold wondrous things out of your law. Bless us, I pray, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen. Can you clap your hands one more time? For the... Now, one thing that I have learned growing up and being a Christian and trying to be a disciple of Christ, and especially as it relates to my study of the Word of God, is that I have to be careful how I even approach the Scriptures. I have to be careful how I read the Scriptures because sometimes we can come to the Bible and read the Bible with so many prejudices or biases, or what we would call presuppositions, things that we already think and know, and then what we do is we take up the Word of God to confirm what we think we already know. And we will read the Bible through a filter of misunderstanding at times, not knowing that we could know what God says but not know what God really means by what he says. Does that make sense to you? So I have to be so careful, and I recognize that when I kind of just shake myself a little bit and go back to the Bible and read it at face value, some of the things I read start to really blow my mind and take some scales off of my eyes that I didn't even know existed because I thought I knew. But the more I find out, that I'm becoming to know more is the more I find out I don't know much. <laughs> the word of God is so vast. It's so deep. And we have to be so careful that we remember that Paul said, and I'm coming to the point, but I got, I got to free myself here. Paul said that we see through a glass darkly. We know in part, we, not all, we prophesy in part. We preach in part. And I, I, I was listening to a man today on, on the computer who was preaching heavily with conviction and passion against interracial marriage. I mean, he was as passionate and as powerful as could be, he was strong and sincerely wrong at the same time. So I recognize that not everything that is preached with passion equals truth. You could even feel something when you're saying it. I wish I had some help in here. 
sweating and people jumping and dancing. But we can't allow ourselves to be so caught up in what we think we know that we think we can't learn anything more. I think I said it the last time that you cannot claim to have a slice of pizza and the whole pizza at the same time. You cannot say you have a slice of cake, yet say you have the whole cake at the same time. You cannot have just one slice of a loaf of bread and then say you have the whole loaf at the same time. So sometimes we can marginalize what we call truth and put it over here in a little box and say that we have the sum total of truth. You may have a truth, but not the whole truth. I wish I had some help in here. So you, you got to open up yourself to the fact or the truth that you might not know everything. And you might have to open up yourself to the truth that some things you thought you knew you have to unlearn in order to learn what is true. There's some things that I've preached in my past that I thought was true when I look at scripture. But when I grow and know, I have to come back to myself, but hold on, that's not right. That's not right. Listen, anything that doesn't change doesn't grow. I wonder if I could, if I could say that. <laughs> Anything that does not grow in its understanding is stuck. And sometimes the name of your church or the name of your organization can be a tombstone. Because you get stuck. At what was supposed to be a starting point. We're not, you're not removing the starting point. But you want to progress from the starting point. If every year I go to a meeting about my business. And all I can hear is about how the business started. That business is bound to fail. I, I, it's, it's bound because it has to be dynamic. There must be something progressing and moving it forward. Can you say amen? amen? And so we have to not remove, but we have to move on from the principles of the doctrine. Lord, help me here tonight. And go on to perfection guess what there might be more in God than what you know right now we talk about unsearchable riches so then my job tonight is to explore this matter of what we call grace somebody say grace say it again grace I, I don't know of any other word that, that probably is as unique and as special and as integral to our salvation as this word grace. I, I want to start out by saying that this divine perfection of God called grace is something that is only exercised on the chosen or the elect of God. When you look at it in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, you find the word grace is connected to God's people. Mercy might be connected to his creation because unlike grace, which is the unmerited favor of God, bestowing his blessing, mercy is the withholding of the judgment of God. So if God was not merciful, we would all be swallowed up in judgment right now. Nobody would be alive if God was not merciful. So mercy is God withholding from you what you deserve. While grace is God giving to you what you do not deserve. We have that simple definition of grace that we say it is the unmerited 
favor of God. Uh, Pink, uh, one of my favorite writers, uh, Arthur Pink, says it like this. "It It is that from which all his blessings flow and exerted in such a way, rather, uh, sorry, not that. This is me writing. This is me. This is all, it's, the, it, it's that from which all blessings flow and exerted in such a way that it is efficacious. Somebody say efficacious. The grace of God is efficacious, meaning that it reaches its intended desire or result. So when God exhibits or expresses his grace, it is something that is so powerful that it never fails. It always reaches its intended result. Lord, help me in here today. Help me, help me. Amen. So let's talk a little bit about grace. Amen. Grace defined. This is pink now. When you talk about grace, divine grace is the sovereign and saving favor of God. Exercised in bestowing blessings upon those who have no merit in them and for which no compensation is demanded. I want to say that one more time. It is the favor of God exercised in bestowing blessings upon those who have no merit in them and for which no compensation is demanded. It's even more than that. It is the favor of God to those who not only have no positive deserts of their own, but also who are thoroughly ill-deserving and hell-deserving. Lord, help me here. It is completely unmerited and unsought. It is altogether unattracted by anything in or from or by the objects upon which it is bestowed. Oh, that's amazing grace. I might have to break that down just a little bit here. So what God is saying is that the grace that I give to you is something you do not deserve. You can never work for. You can never achieve. And it's even further than that. You don't even ask for it because you don't want it. I know I blew some minds right there. But grace in its initiation, because according to Jonah chapter 2 verse 9, salvation is of the Lord. Grace in its initiation is something not only undesired, but unasked for. Let's work it out. Why do we say that? Because truthfully, we give ourselves a little too much credit when it comes to salvation. We give ourselves way too much credit. The only thing necessary that we have that helps the salvation process that we can attribute is sin. (laughs) The only thing we contribute to the salvation process is sin. That's it. That's all we can contribute when it comes to salvation. We don't contribute achievement. We don't contribute merit. We don't even contribute the desire to be saved. The only thing we contribute is sin. What are you saying, preacher? All we contribute is sin? Yes. We give ourselves too much credit. Let's look at the condition of the unregenerate man. Can we do that for a moment? Let's look at the condition of the unregenerate man. There's several scriptures that diagnose man. Second Chronicles chapter 6 verse 36 says, There is no one who does not sin. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 and 10 kind of compact together. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. No truth is in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. 
<laughs> in Romans, or rather Micah chapter 7, verses 2 to 4, the godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorny hedge. Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, when the Pharisees were discussing the fact that the, that the disciples were eating with one unwashing hands, and Jesus had to remind them, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him. For from within and out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from the heart and defile a person. You don't need the devil to make you sin. You can do bad all by yourself. We are naughty by nature. <laughs> we are children of wrath. The children of disobedience. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, desperately sick. Who can know it? Who can understand it? Look at Ecclesiastes chapter three, 9, verse 3. Also, the hearts of the children of men are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live and after that they go to the dead. My God, look at, look at uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 20. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. Proverbs 28, verse 26. Whoever trusts in his own heart is a fool. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Who could be saved in a world like that? Only Noah. How come? He found grace. <laughs> Noah wasn't upright, so God chose him. Noah wasn't doing well, so God chose him. God chose him because he wanted to have grace on somebody. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Clap your hands if you believe what I'm talking about here. So the only thing that we could bring to the table is sin. That's all we had. We didn't have ability. We didn't have achievements. Because again, if we talk about grace and there's something you do for it, it's not grace anymore. If there's something you say you brought to the table, it's no longer grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So your salvation has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with God and the grace he bestows upon you. Undeserving, ill-deserving, hell deserving that's all we are if it's not for the grace of the almighty God and I would like to stick this in here right here when you recognize that you could bring nothing to the table you have no right to look down on anybody else if the person is unsaved you have no right to look down on them. If the person leaves and walks out of the church and by God's grace come back, you still have no right to look down on them. Because the same blood that washed you is the same blood that washed them. The same grace that keeps you is the same grace that brought them back. You have no reason to boast. Because if it's not for Christ, you're not accepted anyway. I, I, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself. I'm going ahead of myself. But the truth of the matter is, is that God still requires perfection. 
he still requires perfection. And the problem is, is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so since he requires perfection, he does not accept you by yourself. Because you in and of yourself can't be perfect. In Adam all die. We are born in sin and shapen in iniquity. So God could never accept me for me. But what he did was make a way to bring one who was acceptable. Lord, help me in here. And then he makes us accepted in the beloved. So even when God is smiling at me, he's not smiling at me because of me. He's smiling at me because of Jesus. Because nothing you've ever done and nothing you're doing and nothing you will ever do is enough to make God accept you. Not of works. And I hope to get to the point too because we need to uh, kill this myth where people think that when you preach grace, you're preaching a greasy grace. Ain't no greasy grace up in here. Ain't no hyper grace up in here. The same grace that saves you is the same grace that teaches you. It's the same grace that transforms you. It's the same grace that works on your will. It's the same grace that energizes you to do even when you don't want to do what is right. It's the same grace that changes you. Lord, am I doing all right? It's the same grace. So it's not a matter of you saying, well, oh, God has grace and, and you know, this, that, and the other. No, 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 no. The, the, amen, amen. Uh, 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 what's that scripture? I'm seeing it in my Bible, but I can't find the first word. Uh, uh, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. What is that grace doing? Teaching us. Grace is a teacher. Grace is an instructor. Grace works on your heart. Grace works on your motive. Grace works on your will. Grace works on your desire. Grace works on your... So you can never pat yourself on the back. Because God is working in you. I said this last night. Both to will and to do. Do you know that for you to be saved, God had to overpower your will? Lord, help me in here. Because nobody, listen. <laughs> I, want to, I want to read it from the Bible because they might, think, they might think I'm making up. You know, welcome to all of you watching by World Wide Web. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for all of the saints that couldn't make it tonight and those come on greet them the truth is is that when you talk about a, 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 a man in his unregenerate state I think Paul says it clearly matter of fact Paul was actually uh, quoting from a psalm that's what he was doing look 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 over here in in chapter Number three of Romans, when Paul is preaching the doctrine of condemnation. In, in verse nine, he says, what then? Are we better than they? In, in other words, are Jews better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. And I'm telling you, sin is what we got to bring to the table. Somebody say sin. That's all we have to bring to the table. That's all. That's it. Nothing more. Amen. Uh, in verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. I don't care how many times you come to church. I don't care what your, how many charitable deeds your family might have done. I don't care how many times you feed the children in the community. I don't care how many people you've taken off the street. Amen. If you are not in Christ, you are not viewed upon as righteous. 
As a matter of fact, can I say this? And I don't want to lose my place here. But let's be honest. Paul was not battered and beaten and, 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 and rejected by his own and, and, and ridiculed and scarfed at because he was preaching baptism or Holy Ghost. You know why Paul was getting licks? Because Paul was preaching a doctrine that said by the deeds of the law, you cannot be justified. I'm in the, I know I'm in the Bible. He was preaching grace. And he was saying all of those laws in the Old Testament. That's why the, Paul had the most problem with legalistic people. Paul had the most problem with Pharisees trying to make you do this and do that and do the other to qualify you being saved. He, he was so mad in Galatians. Paul was so mad in Galatians that he said, I wish those that trouble you were cut off. That's how, man, he had, he had the most problem with legalistic Judaizers telling you you need to be circumcised, you need to fast, you, you, need, you need to do this, you need to do that. And Paul said, no, no, if you begin in grace, you've got to continue on in grace. And, and let me say this here, sometimes we let the world define how we view things. Falling from grace is not when you lie and steal and cheat or commit fornication. That's not what falling from grace means. I want to clear this up tonight. Because when a preacher falls on TV, they say, oh, he fell from grace. That's not what the Bible is talking about. When you fall from grace is when you trust in anything else but Jesus for your salvation. If you trust in anything that you do and not what Jesus has done, you could speak in tongues till you're weak. You have fallen from grace. So you got people watching knee links and dress links and watching weave and I'm in trouble. We're in trouble already, so I might as well talk you ahead of this. You got people looking at folk trying to judge them, amen, and thinking that your salvation is better than theirs because you don't do what they're doing, something like that. You better learn to keep your eyes on Jesus. And I'm afraid that many people. I want to stand up on a chair. That many people are trusting in Acts 2.38. But they're not trusting in Jesus for their salvation. And I've been baptized in Jesus name. And on May 31st, 1989, I knelt at an altar at an old-fashioned Pentecostal until I was filled with the Holy Ghost and I spoke in tongues for three days. But can I tell you this? That's not all there is to it. You got to believe in Jesus that his righteousness is what covers you. Because it's not what I'm doing that saves me. It's what he's done that saves me. It's believing in what he did in Calvary that saves me and keeps me saved. My God. So you trust in some little doctrines that you have and I'm not belittling anything in here but I want to tell you the reason why Paul was so rejected and so beaten is because he was preaching a righteousness apart from the law. Woe unto you if in vain you teach the traditions of man and substitute that instead of preaching the gospel of Jesus. Woe unto you! You're worshiping God in vain! Your worship is empty. If your salvation is tied up in you don't do this, you don't go here, you don't wear that, and you don't wear this, my God, you need a good dose of grace in your life. I'm sorry, that's coming to me and I'm giving to you as I get it. Somebody say grace. Somebody say grace. Somebody say grace.
There is none righteous. Oh God, help me. No, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. Somebody say none. So there's nobody in your unregenerate state that seeks after God. Do you know how revolutionary that thought is? Do you recognize that anybody that is truly reaching for God, it means they've been regenerated? I know I'm making some big statements. <laughs> Listen, I told some saints earlier this year, I'm losing my filter. I'm 43 and the older I get is the plainer I get. God help you. Because I recognize it's possible to preach from the Bible and still not preach the gospel. It's possible to preach my tradition and still not preach the gospel. So I had to turn how I was talking and go back to what Jesus said. There's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that seeks after God. So if God is going to save anybody, it's not a work of synergism. Synergism means two or more things working together. S-Y-N. E-R-G-I-S-M. It's not synergism. It's monergism. M-O-N-E-R-G-I-S-M. That means it's God working by himself. Come on. It's God choosing by himself. It's God regenerating by himself. Because the condition of man is incorrigible. Radically corrupt. Totally morally depraved. Doesn't want God. And don't let people fool you. They might want the peace of God, but they don't want God. Oh, God help me. Sometimes when they come to church, they want the joy that God brings, but they don't want God. Only God can make you want God. Because no man can come. No man, no man can, there's none that seeks after God. So no man, a universal negative can, speaking of ability, no man has the ability to come to God except the Father draws. You can't love God unless God love you first. Yes. We love him because he first. You can't choose God except he choose you. I'm getting into something here now. St. John 15 verse 6. He said to his disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. So my choice of you was not based on your choice of me. Because you can't seek me. You dead. It's not that you're sick in sin. It's not that you're deathly ill in sin. It's not that you're in hospice in sin. It's not that you're on morphine and getting palliative care treatment in sin. It's not that you're even on life support in sin. You have he quickened who were dead. Can a dead man see? Can a dead man hear? Can a dead man ball out Jesus? <laughs> so then since that is the case that we're dead and you can't come except he draws you it simply means that salvation is totally a work of grace somebody say grace 
Didn't we sing it? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch. Like me. You might be cute, but you are still a wretch. Hips, lips, and fingertips in place, but you're a wretch. You're a low-down, nasty, dirty dog sinner. A wretch. Deserving for hell. Deserving for destruction. Because the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Sin, when it is finished, bring forth death. The sting of death is what? Oh, Lord, help me in here. I'm in my Bible tonight. So we have nothing to boast of. God has to choose us. He has to bring us to life. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody shout grace. I once was lost. You didn't find the Lord. He wasn't lost. I'm so glad I found the Lord. No, 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 no. He wasn't lost. I once was lost. But now I'm found. I once was blind. Can anybody see Jesus in here? Lift your hand and worship God in here. That's grace. Somebody say amazing grace. So then God has to do his expression of grace. We can talk about grace first of all. That it is eternal. Grace was planned for us. Before it was exercised, purposed before it was imparted. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So the plan was before the world began. And he chose you before the world began. And he ordained you before the world began. And he sanctified you before the world began. And he predestinated you before the world began. Began and he justified you before the world. Grace. Somebody say grace. Ephesians chapter 1 helps me here. It helps me here. It helps me here. Because Ephesians chapter 1, I think verse 3, if I can find it here, verses 3 and 4. Thank you, Reverend. You see, that's what grace should make you do. When you recognize you had nothing to do with it, those are the people that praise God. You know. When you recognize there's nothing you could do to earn it, and there's nothing you could do to keep it, God help me here. Those are the people that say, oh my God, I can't believe this. This is, this is unbelievable. It's amazing. Look at your neighbor, tell him it's amazing grace. It's amazing. It's amazing grace. It's amazing grace that God should love a sinner such as I. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose me before he said, let there be I think I said it last time. We have a cute little song that says when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. But if the scripture is right, and I know it's right, long before he got to Gethsemane, long before he got to the cross, long before he knew Mary was his mother, long before he came down, before he said, let there be and there was, he chose. Tell somebody beside you, I had to be here. I had to be here. You know, 
Now listen, this is where some scriptures start to even make more sense to me. Because I always knew that scripture. But when he said, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his. Don't say people, say, say his. God had a people he was coming to save. Who was he coming to save? The ones he chose. Lord, help me. The sheep that would know his voice. He shall, he shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By him shall his righteous servant justify many. He had a number already picked out. You think God does not elect? Yes, he does. He has compassion on whom he will. He has grace on whom he will. Look at what Elijah was told when he thought, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left. God said, you think you're the only one left? I've reserved unto me 7,000 more that have not bowed there because God knows how to elect and to preserve the ones that he's elected. We'll get to that some kind of way. Woo, somebody clap their hands and give God glory. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah saying, Jeremiah, Saint John, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee. Before your mother met your father, before she looked at him and said, ooh, he's so fine. Before they knew your hair was black or brown and your eyes were brown or blue. Before you, in it, before I, listen, God, Lord help me. God said before I formed you in the belly. So God is taking responsibility for the formation of Jeremiah in his mother's womb. Hello somebody. So when that spermatozoa met the ovum there and attached itself to the endometrial lining of his mother's uterus, God was taking responsibility for the formation of Jeremiah. And said, you're not an accident. And can I tell you something? Whether you're the product of a loving relationship or the product of a rape victim, if God determined you to be here, you're not an accident. I wish I had some help in here. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Now, here's a problem. What does God mean by I knew thee? Does it mean that God had information about Jeremiah? Does it mean that God had certain uh, 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 bit of uh, data on Jeremiah? The truth of the matter is, when God uses the term no, it's different than when we use the term no. Because the truth is, is that when we look at how God, how God uses the word no, we find out that it has more to do with God choosing and placing favor on whomever he desires. Can I say that one more time? When God chooses, it means that God is actually showing favor, choosing one over against another. So when he talks about knowing you, when he talks about knowing you in the sense of not only about you, he means he knows you in the sense of having a covenant with you. Somebody say covenant. Come on, somebody say covenant. So when we talk about this, this is what we mean. We mean it signifies to regard with favor, denoting not mere cognition, but an affection for the object in you. For instance, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 17, God says to Israel, I knew thee by name. But God, hold on. What you mean you knew? Don't you know everybody by name? You see the point? Because God is omniscient, isn't he? He knows everything and everyone. He, 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 he know. But in terms of him speaking to his people, 
When he says, I know you by name, it means I have a covenant with you. I've made a choice of you. I have chosen you. For instance, when he says in Amos chapter 3 verse 2 uh, to Israel, he says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. What do you mean you only know Israel above all the families of the earth? Don't you know the Amorites, the Gergeshites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Termites? Don't you know all these people? Don't you know them? What are you talking about? It means that I have a relation. I have a covenant with these people. So when God says, I knew you, it's the same manner in which he says, amen, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. So when he says, I know you or I knew you, it means he has made a choice of you and has given you favor as opposed to somebody else. That's why in Matthew chapter 7 verse 23, when many shall come in the last day saying, haven't I prophesied in your name? Haven't I done many mighty works in your name? He will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I will profess unto them, I never, I never knew you. So it's not that God can know you and annoy you. It means I've never had a covenant with you. Lord, help me. Y'all looking at me a little crazy here. But when God says, I know you, (laughs) when he says, my sheep know my voice and I'm known of them, when he says, I know you, it means there is a covenant. There is a relationship. There is a signification of favor that is upon your life. Aren't you glad that God knows you tonight? So when he said to Jeremiah, before I formed in the belly, I knew you. That means I chose you, Jeremiah. I lavished my grace on you before you got here. It was only a matter of time before you realized what I have done already. And what I declared in eternity will come to pass in time. Hello, somebody. So whom he did foreknow. Whom he knew before. This is not a matter of prescience. This is not God choosing you because he knew. No, you would choose him. Because a dead man can't choose God. I wish I had some here. Y'all lo- I'm losing y'all already. Alright, all right. let, me, let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. Talk about grace. There, there's, a, there's a beautiful scripture. I was sharing it with Nathan on the way here to the church. And I'm going to wrap up soon. Acts 13, verse number 48. Now, when I first read the scripture, I read it again to make sure I didn't misread it. Because it was just so plain, it was almost embarrassing. Look at Acts 13, 48. And and when the Gentiles, Acts 13, verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many... I wish y'all was reading with me. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. I wonder if I can read that again. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. The only ones that believed were the ones that were ordained to eternal life. Who did the ordination? God in eternity past said, I have a people. God help me. If I, listen, the truth is, if God didn't do any ordination, nobody would be saved. If God was fair, nobody would be saved. Because some people would say, that's not fair. And charge God with being unjust. Hello, somebody. They would charge God with being unjust. But if God was completely just, everybody goes to hell. Everybody's lost. Everybody is dead and remains so. But God said, in order to show my compassion, I'm going to have mercy on whom I will. And compassion on whom I will. So it's not of him that willeth. Or of him that runneth. But it is of God. Who shows mercy. Mercy there was great. And grace was free. 
ardent there was multiplied to me. I wish I had somebody worship with me. I feel like I'm a blow up in it. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. You say it's not fair? Thank God God is not fair all the time. Thank God he doesn't show his justice all the time. For Lord, if you should mark iniquity. Lord, if you should take an account for every wrong. Who would stand? But there is forgiveness. Blessed is the man. Unto whom the Lord doth not impute iniquity. Grace. Somebody say grace. Somebody say grace. Lift your hand and say grace. Lift up both your hand and say grace. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. But his grace has brought me safe thus far and his grace will lead me home clap your hands if you know his grace is sufficient let me just make one more point and finish for tonight we'll pick up again tomorrow grace is free because none ever purchased it cannot be purchased. Everybody say free. Say again, it's free. And when we talk about grace being free, that means it's not an earned achievement. But initially it comes undeserved and as I said, unasked. And the Apostle Paul preached the gospel of grace and in his writings, grace stands in direct opposition to works and worthiness. All works and worthiness of whatever kind or degree. This is abundantly clear from Romans chapter 11 verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Grace and works will no more be fused together as can be oil and water. Grace and works will no more unite than acid and alkali. They are mutually exclusive. So when we talk about being saved by grace, we're talking about the admission of the fact that we are completely helpless and hopeless without the expression of God's grace in our life. Not just for the initiation of our salvation, but for the preservation of our lives even now. Because even when you look at Paul, Paul at one time said, I labor more abundantly than all the apostles. Nevertheless, it's not me, but it is the grace that's working mightily in me. So even what you do for Christ, we can't pat you on the back. Because if you're doing more, it's because more of God's grace is working in you. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So if we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And even if we get a crown, like the elders will take it off and throw it at his feet and say worthy is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world his grace saved me his grace is preserving me his grace is keeping me it's not just his grace assisting me his grace is giving me life and working in me and teaching me and chastening me and blessing me it's not me it's the grace the grace Stand all over this building right now. Hayabosha. Lift your hands. If you thank God. For amazing grace. 
amazing grace. Come on, lift your hands. If you know you can't do it by yourself, it's God working in you. That efficacious grace that is preserving you, God infusing in you, working in you what he only works in his elect, working in you what he only works in his chosen, exercising himself in you. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace, 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 grace. Come on, lift your voices now. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Come on, you have a praise that the angels can't utter. You have a song that the angels can't sing. You have a worship that the angels can't express because they don't know what it's like to be redeemed. They don't know what it's like to receive God's grace. They don't know what it's like to have blood shed for them. But you, my brothers and sisters, we stand in awe of the grace <laughs> of our mighty God. A grace that is sovereign. A grace Oh, Shabbat. Come on, lift your voices. Lift your voices. Lift your voices. Lift your voices. Come on, Pastor John. Lift your voices. Lift your voices. Hallelujah. 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 We worship you, God. More grace. He giveth more grace. He giveth more grace. Grace on top of grace. The God of all grace. Yes, that's him. His grace is sufficient. His grace is enough. His grace will keep you. His grace will help you. His grace. It's a throne of grace. Grace reigns from the throne. Grace reigns from the throne. <laughs> hallelujah 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 oh could we give the Lord thanks yes what a story one songwriter pictured 